25 years ago, most of you were not even born. And I have to say, at that stage, uh, when you talked about mental health uh, in this country, it was a topic that no one wanted to touch. Uh, it was a topic that most people associated with madness. Uh, it was a topic that most people associated with psychiatry and asylums. Uh, and I think we've come such an immense long way since then. But let me tell you a little bit about my own story uh, in trying to work in this sector for the last two and a half decades. When I started working here, I remember many people telling me that this was the wrong subject for this country. I have a very clear recollection of people telling me back in the 90s, early 90s, that uh, uh, India had far more important things to worry about than mental health. I also remember people telling me as a health uh, person that actually uh, mental health was really a luxury item for poor people. Uh, I remember them saying this was a problem of people like myself, we are coming from an English-speaking urban family, that poor people in India actually had more important things to worry about, like food and shelter. And so mental health, it seemed in those days at least, was something that only the privileged uh, were entitled to actually experience. The poor had other more important things to worry about. It was frivolous, it was trivial. I spent quite a bit of my early phase of my career really investigating this, actually. Maybe they were right. Maybe those attitudes were correct. Maybe, in fact, this is a Western problem. Maybe this is a problem of anglicized, anglophone, urban, beef-eating Indians. And I kind of thought to myself, uh, maybe I should go and investigate this a little bit. I spent a, a good decade of my early career uh, researching this matter. And, you know, contrary to what, uh, in fact, and of course most of you will find this amazing that people could think like that, that they did think like that, and I can assure you a lot of people still think like that. We found that actually these were not just rich people's problems. You know, mental illness uh, was, as it were, an equal opportunity illness. It affected everyone in this country. And indeed, if anything, those people who lived at the margins were often those who suffered the most, precisely because they lived at the margins, because they had so many other uh, uh, factors that made their lives difficult. Uh, and in fact, living difficult lives actually made mental illness more common. I also discovered this rather strange thing that whereas the whole country was getting seized by pharma suicides, that in fact, and that is a very important problem, as you know politically this is a hugely important problem in our country, that actually the most common demographic where suicides were felling people in this country was actually young people. And about a decade ago I started working with the Registrar General of India to try and investigate actually what is the pattern of suicide in India. And to our complete astonishment, it turned out that actually suicide was the number one cause of death in young Indians. Now, of course, everyone accepts this fact. Even though everyone accepts this fact, of course, uh, no one does anything about it. Uh, and it struck me as really tragic. I remember last week, uh, perhaps one of the most tragic stories that I cut them out in a gaudish way because I can use them for lectures. Uh, but there was this newspaper story, I don't know how many of you caught it, of a 16-year-old uh, and a 15-year-old, uh, a couple uh, that locked themselves up in a room and killed themselves. They were an uh, inter-religious couple. Uh, and this is not the first time that I have read about these horrific stories of young Indians dying for love. Uh, and of course reflects a larger story of intolerance in our country. Nevertheless, it struck me as really interesting that this, this incredible fact that the youth of our country kill themselves and die for that reason more often than any other single cause of death. And that in this country we have no dialogue on as to why young people choose to kill themselves and die for more than any other reason. Now, in spite of all this evidence, I remember about maybe 10 years ago now it might be, I remember going to the Ministry of Health here in Delhi and uh, asking the minister, you know, isn't it time for us to maybe respond to this issue? And I remember then the thing that was thrown back at me, that uh, okay, you've got all this evidence, and this is a common problem, it's associated with poverty, it's also a killer problem, it's not just as it were in your mind, um, but we don't have enough psychiatrists, we don't have enough psychologists. And this is true, actually. We have about three to 4,000 mental health professionals in India, most of whom actually live and work in big metros. And the vast majority of them live and work in the private sector, often excluding a very large number of people. But there's the other issue as well. How many young people do you know who would be willing to go and see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, even if we had them in every street corner? The fact remains that most of us are uncomfortable to see a psychiatrist. So I started experimenting with the idea of actually providing mental health care in the hands of ordinary people. Literally ordinary people. 
people whose only interest was that they wanted to work in this sector. They needed no qualifications, no training, no specialization. Your average person off the street. We started doing this rather radical idea of taking ordinary people, training them in delivering psychological interventions, and then running, of course, what the kind of experiments that doctors would consider the minimum standard of evidence, what we call trials. We've run these trials now for a whole range of mental health conditions, everything from autism through to depression, schizophrenia, people with dementia, etc. And each of these different experiments has come up with the same result that care can be delivered by ordinary people, frontline workers, peers, people who have themselves had a lived experience of mental illness with appropriate training and supervision, and they can do it remarkably well, very effectively as well. I thought about this and uh, then decided that this was good advice. He went to his, uh, one of the ministers in his cabinet, a, a lady, who he then asked, would she run Norway while he recovered from depression? So she said, yes, surely she would. Uh, and there was no way so she wasn't going to take over the government while he was away. Um, he didn't just vanish for a couple of weeks like some of our leaders do when they're sick. Uh, she actually went, uh, he actually went on television and told the people of Norway that his doctor told him he was depressed and he needed therapy and he needed to therefore recover. And as Norwegians do, he went off to a fishing cabin in the north of Norway, got his therapist with him, I assume, got better, came back, and started ruling Norway again. What's really remarkable about his story was that in the next parliamentary elections, he won the next election with an even bigger majority than the first election. And when I heard him speak and, and had, the, had the honor of meeting him, I remember him telling me that it showed that so much of stigma is internalized. That actually people out there, when you share your stories, actually most people react with compassion. Not all people, but I believe most people have compassion in their hearts. And I want to just read out something he said, which I actually recorded. He said, stigma is the main problem regarding our efforts to improve the mental health situation in our countries. I want to contribute to combating stigma. And then he ends with the line that I think is most relevant for today's function. Therefore, I'm here today to tell you my own story. It's so true. I do believe in the power of telling one's own stories to change hearts and minds. We've had so many people tell their own stories in different ways. Some of you will have heard Bruce Springsteen's song uh, about his own struggle with depression, and others would have heard a lot about our own Deepika Padukone, who, by the way, I have a selfie with. And that is how I, that I swear to God I have a selfie. If those of you don't believe it, I can show it to you. I'm a bit of a fanboy there. But anyway, um, but we need to go beyond prime ministers. We need to go beyond film stars. We need to go beyond celebrities. And I think we need to really reach out to ordinary, regular folks, the same kind of folks who I think are the ones who actually bear the brunt, the burden of mental health problems, mainly because they not only have them, but because they have no one to turn to when they have them. And in particular, given the massive demographic of young people in our country, I think we need to harness the amazing confluence, the amazing energy of young people, the power of their stories, the reach of the internet, and the excitement of the arts. And this, for me, is the very essence of It's Okay to Talk. Let's join together and do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>